the participants whose questions have been selected for this session uh, they are requested to keep their audio video settings ready during the question and answer session their name may be called any time please be prepared with your question and set your audio and video settings appropriately uh even uh, those participants can uh, test their video setting just uh, right now before we go live uh, at 8 pm so they can definitely test their video setting uh, maybe within within 2 minutes uh, so it's uh, 7 uh, 1954 maybe by 57 all these formalities can be completed and thereafter we will give the signal for uh, going live sure sir those 15 participants can test their video. During the session, participants their video off only when their name will be called. Uh, participants will keep your mic on mute. All the participants are requested to please keep your mic on mute. Isha, please take care. Yes, ma'am. All the participants are required to keep their video off during the session. Only when their name is called for asking the question, at that time they can put their video on. And immediately after asking your question, please turn your mic off so that there is no
Good morning, Scott. I can see that you have joined. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we're waiting on uh, Ishari and Professor Strickland right now. Yes. I am on. OK. Yes. yes. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, morning, Professor Siklin. That was uh, Dr. Biswajit Saha. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we are uh, waiting on, uh, we were just waiting on you. So now we will start in uh, five seconds. It will go live on YouTube. So are you OK if we start now? Or do you want a yeah, couple of no, minutes? No, no. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sudesh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can start uh, the live, the process to set it up live, and then let me know. I will officially then start the program. Uh, fine, ma'am. I'm not putting it on the session. Uh, oh, your yeah. voice was not clear, Sudesh. Um, we are live now. OK. Now you can stop. All right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Maria mm -hmm. Mathai, and I'm the director of MM Advisory. We come to you today from our various homes and offices in India and Canada for a very special occasion, a fireside chat with Professor Donna Strickland from the University of Waterloo. This fireside chat is a part of the CBSE Canada series of virtual de uh, professional development sessions under the banner of Innovate and Inspire. Before we start, I would like to invite Dr. Biswajit Saha, Director Training and Skills Education, CBSE. Uh, Dr. Biswajit Saha is the Director of Vocational Education at CBSE since 2012. And prior to joining C CBSE, he worked as assistant professor at Tripura Institute of Technology, Government of Tripura, DIA, National Informatics Center, and Ministry of ICT. Dr. Saha, I would like to invite you to give context of the Canada series, as well as uh, say a few words to welcome Professor Strickland. Thank you, Maria. I think it's a proud privilege and a happy moment for all Indian today, and especially for the member of uh, CBSC family. Uh, my good colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Emanuel, uh, Director Academy, uh, and other officers from academic training skill and head uh, public relations, uh, Madam Rama, all are present here today to welcome you, uh, Professor Dona Strickland. Uh, first of all, Namaskar and welcome to the, this specific series um, where our uh, principal, senior teacher, uh, especially from science background, uh, combined. Uh, you know, obviously, we, we try to select the more physics teachers, uh, certain biasness we show. Uh, but uh, definitely that mixed uh, background uh, teacher and principals are very much uh, eagerly waiting uh, to listen to you. Some of them are, of course, uh, on board, but majority, uh, we are uh, having more than 23,000 school uh, in India and abroad, uh, more than 250 schools abroad. So all the teacher, principal, and uh, mainly, uh, today's uh, the prime attraction, the student and parents are also very much on board uh, through YouTube and they are eagerly waiting to listen to you. So it's a humble request to uh, bless all these uh, student and of course the teachers, they are, they are going to interact with you. Some of our officers are also going to interact with, uh, with you. Uh, 
So this Canada India, especially Inspire and Innovation series was conceptualized uh, with the uh, guidance of our honorable chairman, Sri Manu Jahuja sir. And of course, the team CBSC, uh, different department, we are working together uh, to celebrate this kind of event. And so that uh, rather, first of all, we need to come out from the, our uh, stringent boundary and how uh, when two continents uh, are on the same plane, I think there itself the, the discussions on physics is already started. Now I think you have to put some fire to ignite uh, the mindset and so that real scientific temperament is being started. It is already there if we look back to our NCN India and over a period of time, there was a huge works done by uh, our ancestor, uh, be it C.V. Raman, be it Acharya Prafulla Chandra Rai, Jagadish Chandra Bosch, Satyan Bosch. So all are uh, worked uh, we, in, in collaborations with the scientific community across the globe. Uh, so again, CBSC, from the side of the CBSC, we try to start this uh, rejoining and maybe through this kind of efforts, our request would be how this department can go to a new height and the energy level what uh, are being possessed by Indian teachers. If they get opportunity to work with your research teams later on uh, through these conversations and later on some opportunity to work uh, with you and your extended team members across the globe, I think that way, again, we can start uh, spreading and especially for the student community, the new generations, why we are talking about 21st century skills, but our sciences, I don't know, somewhere, I am also confused, C certainly somewhere it is stagnant. Technology has taken exponential growth, but science need to go uh, to that level. And for that, I think collaborative efforts only can uh, take uh, us to that exponential growth. I think your supports and blessings is highly required. Once again, welcome you to this uh, mega event. And uh, through interactions, uh, I'm requesting all the participants just try to follow the protocol so and it, it should be uh, showcasing one way honor to uh, Nobel laureate Professor Dona. It's an opportunity that has utilized, and of course, to the introduction. And later on, we would like to invite you uh, to a physical event and some collaborative work with extend. Once again, thank you and welcome you all. Over thank to Maria. You, okay, you can start the real fireside uh, chatting with uh, Professor Dona now. Thank you, Dr. Saha, and uh, our sincere thanks to Chairman Mr. Ahuja also in absentia for conceptualizing this uh, session. So uh, we now begin with our official session, the fireside chat. As we look around the world today, we notice a lot of the news that is either depressing or at least perplexing and worrying. But there are also these flashes of brilliance, such as the arrival of the COVID-19 vaccines in an astonishingly short time. And such flashes of brilliance that suggests that we, as human beings and our civilization, continue to advance in so many beneficial ways. One such occasion was in 2018, when the Nobel Prize in Physics was jointly awarded to three physicists for their groundbreaking invention in the field of laser physics. Among them was our guest of honor today, Professor Donna Strickland, who along with her PhD supervisor found a way that helped create the most intense laser pulses ever generated. Their research has several applications today in industry and medicine, this includes the cutting of a patient's cornea in laser eye surgery, what we know mostly as LASIK, and the machining of small glass parts for use in cell phone. It is my honor to introduce Professor Donna Strickland to this forum and audience in India today. 
Donna Strickland is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Waterloo and is one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018 for developing chirped pulse amplification or CPA with Gerard Muru, a PhD supervisor at that time. They published this Nobel winning research in 1985 when she was a PhD student at the University of Rochester in New York State. In 1997, she joined the University of Waterloo in Canada, where her ultra-fast laser group develops high-intensity laser systems for non-linear optics investigations. Professor Strickland earned a PhD in optics from the University of Rochester and a Bachelor of Engineering from McMaster University. And it is now my privilege and pleasure to welcome the guest of honor tonight, Professor Donna Strickland. We are very grateful to you for taking out the time today for this interaction, Professor Strickland. Welcome. Thank, Thank you very much. Glad well, to be here. Yeah. Welcome to the CBSC Canada Innovate and Inspire session, where we seek to connect our educators and students across India to enriching and deeply inspiring Canadian learning experiences. Today, we have educators from over 200 schools joining live for this session, and many more, including students, joining in live via YouTube. In our session today, learning about your life story, your quest for knowledge, how it led you to the pinnacles of scientific achievement, and how you see the future. This will be a deeply enriching experience for us. And as we go through the various topics during this chat, I will also have members from the audience ask their questions so we can have a more interactive session. I have to begin by first congratulating you on winning the Nobel Prize. Congratulations from all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know it's two years old, but I, I hope you never get tired of uh, hearing that. No. So you were born in and grew up in Guelph. Your mother was an English teacher and your father was an electrical engineer. Your sister studied math at university. The academic streak runs in your family. Is your family the norm in Canada or do you feel that your interest in physics is linked to the way your parents brought you up? Well, I don't know if there's such a thing as a norm anywhere. Um, I will say, you know, my grandfather, my father's father had zero education. He grew up in a fishing village in Newfoundland and, and did not learn to read, write, or do simple math until he retired. Um, and then his two sons, in, they were in Nova Scotia in Canada, a small town, and they didn't even have grade 12 uh, at their high school, which is what is needed to go to university. And uh, my uncle actually was so intelligent that his teacher... Uh, in grade 11 said, this is, this is a shame. You belong going to university, so I will get correspondence courses and I will help you. And uh, it was the banker's wife who said she would fund him to go to university. So it was very rare, right? Just one generation ahead of me. On my mother's side, she grew up in a farming town and um, her mother didn't get to go past grade eight because farm girls didn't do that. Uh, and yet both she and her sister went to university. So I think um, they both really felt like they benefited from going to university. And so I think their children grew up hearing and understanding that they felt like they were the ones that were uh, given this opportunity uh, to go. So when we grew up, the conversation was never if you go to university, it was always when you go to university. So I think that was instilled in us. Um, but I, you know, there's no norm and one person's norm is another person's oddity. So it's, it's just the way, I, and I do feel very fortunate that I got to go. I think uh, we are all feeling exactly that. And now I have a related question from Girija Ki from Chinmaya Vidyalaya School in Badatala, Kochi. Girija, can you ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, my question is um, on the personal front. Uh, did your mother's love for teaching and language influence your scientific journey and research in any significant manner? 
Yes, okay. So first of all, I want to be clear. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mother until I was in high school. And actually, my father was told he was going to die. He did not die for another 20 years, but it was because of that fear of having to raise three children, she went back and started teaching in my high school. I was in grade 12. So I did not grow up with a teacher as a mother. I did have a stay-at-home mother. Um, I will also say that she really liked math when she was at high school, but was convinced as a, a female that she should not take sciences at university. And so that's why she went into English and history at university. But I grew up hearing her say, I wish I had stuck to what I was good at. Nobody should have told me what I should do. I would be a much better math teacher than I am an English teacher, because that's really where I'm naturally, you know, good. So I think that probably helped steer my decision more than had it been. Now she is much better at English. She was she no longer with us, but um, she would actually read ink. I would send letters home and she would read ink them. And my dad stopped her from sending them back saying, if you send back these red inked uh, letters, she's never going to write us again. So don't, <laughs> don't do that. So she, she was dismayed at my poor English and grammar, but uh, so she tried to help me when she could. But <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, since you talked about your schooling, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, student were you? Were you the keen one, the one with all the answers, or were you a backbencher? Well, it probably depended on which class I was in. Um, I certainly remember a math classes sometimes really, you know, if I saw a mistake happen, I would certainly put up my hand and say, I don't think so. Uh, obviously, I tried to stay hidden in English classes. I've already said I, I couldn't do it. And, and, you know, when you had to do something like poetry, I also have a terrible memory. So sometimes you'd have to like memorize something and recite it in English. And I would just think, oh, don't ask me, don't ask me. Um, so it just depends. But um, I was actually very shy by, you know, high school age. So I probably uh, tried very hard not to stand out. You're, you're on mute. Getting on mute. So uh, since we are on schooling, I think I have to ask you this question. It's a very obvious question. And uh, especially when you think that this is an audience of teachers, uh, we had more, I think this was one of the most popular questions that we got. We had more than 100 people say that you have to ask her this. Uh, were there any teachers who made an impact on you? Who were your favorites? And what was it that they did as teachers, which you remember even now? I have to say, I liked most of my teachers. I had some that I really didn't like, so let's not mention them. Um, I don't know. There's some stories I remember. I went uh, on a band trip uh, at the time of our grade 12 chemistry test. And so a lot of us were in this grade 12 chemistry test. So the teacher let us take it after hours when we returned um, on the band trip to England. And what I remember is that she, be, before she handed out the test, she handed she went around with this basket of chocolate bars and said, you cannot uh, do your best work on an empty stomach. So first we'll eat and then we'll, we'll test you. So I mean, and it made you think, okay, she's really trying to cheer us on. She's not, you know, so I, I, I liked that. I think she was also fabulous. She was a, my chemistry, you know, like I said, chemistry teacher. Her husband was a chemistry professor at the university and she would gather things from his lab and bring them in and try to really uh, excite people. So she was one of the ones. I had other, my physics teachers tried to encourage me, sometimes more with um, scolding than with, you know, <laughs> say, look at Donna, you're better than this. You should be trying harder. Um, don't let your opportunities go by. So uh, I've had different teachers that uh, treated me differently and uh but but always i felt uh, supported by my teachers and and pushed and, and that's i think that's great i wouldn't mind having the teacher who handed out chocolates in fact <laughs> I think it's something that ever since you've read it, even in the Harry Potter books where the chocolate kind of warms you up and readies you, it's, it, yeah, it follows from there. So I have a question from Mr. Anish Pille from DPS Vadodra, which is linked to your schooling days itself. Anish? Namaste, ma'am. 
Namaste, Professor Strickland. My question for uh, you is, what got you inclined towards the subject of physics during your schooling days? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What got you inclined to the subject of physics during your schooling days? Okay, well, I was very good at math and, and physics. That's, and I wasn't, I've already said, I wasn't good at English. I wasn't good at history or geography. Um, so I really was narrow. Um, so there wasn't much choice for me. It had to be either math, physics, or engineering. Uh, my dad was an engineer. I think I have to correct. My sister went uh, to school in engineering the year ahead of me. She wasn't in math. Um, and, uh, you know, so I thought engineering would be the safe thing to do because you, you could get a good job afterwards. Um, I didn't go to math. This is how it came up. I think someone's probably heard me say that because I was so shy, I decided I wouldn't go to the University of Waterloo where my sister was and my best friend was going to go into engineering there. I thought I had to go somewhere that I didn't know people to step out of my comfort zone. And so I thought, okay, but Waterloo is so good for math. I decided I wouldn't do math <laughs> if I didn't go to Waterloo. So that left physics and engineering. Um, and when I was looking through the calendars from our uh, universities nearby, I mean, people in Ontario in those days certainly didn't go very far from home. We like to go from home, but not beyond Ontario. Um, McMaster had a program on lasers and electro optics in an engineering physics program. And I went, oh, that just sounds so cool. Got to do that. So it, it was really just seeing that. Okay. Thank you, Mom. Yeah. Thank you. So moving on from school, as you said, you went to McMaster in uh, Hamilton for your bachelor's. You've kind of uh, answered a bit in part my next question i wanted you to go back to that time and uh, share with us in a bit more detail how did the high school you decide on the university and the course yeah so i that's like that i think i found math the most enjoyable uh subject right i mean to me math I'll ask, answer the high school question but since I answered the university when I went a bit. Math to me was like doing puzzles and doing puzzles was fun. Uh, and so I enjoyed that. Um, by the time we get into what's here at the time was grade 13 physics, uh, you know, it was starting to be like puzzles as well. And so I thought both were very enjoyable. I thought physics would be more fun than engineering in a way. On the other hand, I wasn't sure if it would lead to a job, right? And I, the other thing about my mother, she would say, just because you're really good in high school doesn't mean when you go to university, you'll be that good. You have to be ready to just be average when you get to university. So just be ready for that. Um, and so I, I was sort of like, going, oh, do I risk going into physics uh, if I end up being average and not going on to grad school? Um, and so this is why I think engineering physics really appealed to me. I think it was like I could walk the line. I could stay in engineering or I could still go into uh, physics type uh, work in grad school. Uh, and then also, like I said, when I saw lasers, I just thought those sounded so futuristic. People, students today will have to realize that then we did not see lasers everywhere like we do now. And so it was a very futuristic thing and, and it seemed exciting. Uh, and so I just thought that sounded like something really worth pursuing. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So your mom sounds like a lot of mothers that I actually know, including my own. I can practically hear that voice saying something similar in the background. So uh, at McMaster, the course that you chose, as you said, you went in for engineering physics. I believe you were one of three women in your class. Did you find it intimidating to be in an environment where you were in a minority because of your gender? Well, okay, I was one of three. My sister was one of three out of a hundred, so she was much more. And she was actually, they were all very pretty girls, and she was, they were known as Charlie's Angels, which was a big TV show at the time, about three women in detective. Um, I was three out of 18, so I wouldn't say I felt like overwhelming that, oh my goodness, there were so few women. 
Uh, I also just never really paid much attention to it. I have to say that I've never understood it. Uh, when my sister told me that she was one of three out of a hundred, because she went the year ahead of me, I asked why. I said, I don't understand. Why are women doing it? And she goes, I don't know. Right Now, I will say that most people that go into engineering, go into engineering because their fathers were engineers. Um, because it wasn't something. Now it's taught. My daughter took engineering courses at high school, but in my day, you didn't even know what the word engineering meant as a high school student. And so I think it was mostly children of engineers that went into engineering. And of course, the previous generation would have been all fathers. Um, but on the other hand, so, but, but again, the way I was raised, I never thought. And in my high school, people never thought it was weird that I was a good math student and, and female. A lot of the good math students were females and nobody thought that was odd either. So I was really quite surprised that women didn't go in, but I, it didn't bother me. I just, <laughs> I knew, I knew I belonged and therefore that was fine with me. You're on mute again. I think it's a global mute, which keeps, I think it's a global mute, which happens when you are speaking and I just have to remember to keep unmuting myself. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, at this point, I'll uh, bring in Vidya Lakshmi Vinod from Sunrise English Private School in Abu Dhabi for her question. Hello, Professor. Nice to meet you. So my question is, from Sally Wright to Marie Curie, Ada Lovelace to Donna Strickland, there are female scientists to be considered as role models or to be discussed about. In spite of women empowerment and efforts to encourage women in all every field of life, why women are underrepresented in the field of STEM? Well, I, I sort of um, don't know that we are anymore um, in physics and, and maybe, but when I, I've sat through 20 years of uh, convocations here at the University of Waterloo, and I, I only sit through the science convocations, and I would say it's predominantly women going across the stage now. So we are soon going to have to ask, where are the boys in science? Now that said, it's most optometry, I think is, you know, it's huge percentage of uh, women in optometry, which a generation ago would not be true. So we have to start wondering why it's going all this way. Um, so then that just leaves the physics, you know, the physical sides of engineering and math still um, where women are not just going in droves. Um, I also think that a lot of it is because society doesn't value physicists. I think women have gone through all the things, you know, they've become doctors and lawyers and businesswomen and, you know, um, <clears throat> they've gone pretty much everywhere. So it's not that women can't do it, shouldn't do it, they're being held back. I think we have to start looking at the psychology about why women don't think it's worthwhile going into physics. So I like the fact that in the United States, they came up with the TV show, The Big Bang Theory. I don't really like how they depict us. On the other hand, it did make physics seem cool, right? We finally didn't have a show again about doctors and lawyers that are supposedly, or business people that are just the cool people in the world. And I think too many parents convince children to, to go to the law or medicine, depending if they're good on the arts or the science side of things. And so women are going out there uh, because those are what society sees as great. I think as time goes on, and there's the more the Microsofts and all these, you know, the Googles and the really people making a lot of money using technical skills, then society's going to wake up and go, whoa, I want to go into those fields. And when society says, and when parents say, that's something to do, I think we'll see women going into it. That's my own take. Though. I think uh, your point is very well taken and uh, we do see even here, we do see an increase in the number of women who are taking up uh, sciences as a profession. But uh, as you mentioned, physics is still not a desirable uh, program. I don't know, physics, physics, like one doesn't meet a lot of people who want to just go in for pure physics. So. Let's uh, hope that after this session, the next generation of students are there going to be a lot of students who want to be physicists. So continuing on this theme of uh, physicists, you are also 
one of the three women ever to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics. Marie Curie was the first one, followed by Maria Mayer in 1963, and uh, then in 2018, you. There seems to be like a half a century gap between each of the three female Nobel Prize winners. So I suppose my next question to you is uh, extension of a few previous ones and about gender and STEM fields. You have shared that in your, like, you know, in your family and in your community, you never felt that there was a distinction in the gender. But uh, I'm sure now you would have, like, you know, you would have recognized that there is a problem. So do you think we can expect the next female winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics in a much shorter period? Oh, well, actually, this year, I'd be a guest one, right? So I am the first female laureate that got to welcome another female laureate. So it only took two oh. years, right? This year, a woman did win again. So there's now four women, and it, it, there was only two years between us. And so we now have a little club for physics female laureate, because there is now, for the first time in history, more than one of us. But, you know, I think going forward, we aren't going to, you know, they'll, they'll happen fairly regularly now. Still on mute. I'm the only one who doesn't go on mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what being the guest of honor is. <laughs> so I have a question from uh, Ms. Drabana Gurajit from CBSE for you. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good morning. So, ma'am, uh, it is again a continuation of the same question. Since you are the, only the third woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics, has it been tough to reach this pinnacle in this male-dominated field? And uh, what obstacles did you have to overcome to be where you are today? Well, I mean, I guess I wasn't aiming to get a Nobel Prize, and so I didn't struggle to try to do it. Um, so I, I can't ask, you know, about that kind of struggle. Um, you know, I don't know. I think I'm, I don't know whether it's my personality or just my luck uh, that I haven't really experienced that much. I would say the only problem has been the fact that as a female in a male-dominated society, I did find my husband very easily, right? I mean, you hardly had to look around you, and there was men everywhere. So... Um, which, you know, on the other side, then male scientists of my generation could not find very many females. So obviously it's a problem for both my husband and me, but, you know, almost every female scientist is married to a scientist. And there's very few jobs for scientists. So I think that's a tough one, right? I actually gave up on the academic career because my husband had his dream job at at and Bell Labs. Uh, and so that's when I became a member of technical staff at Princeton because I thought I might as well live with my husband. Actually, our first year of marriage, uh, we lived apart. Um, I, I moved from Ottawa to California, and my husband was living in New Jersey and remained living in New Jersey. So we didn't even live together our first year of marriage. Um, and so, I mean, that's a struggle, but I still chose to be employed and to be employed um, to use my science education. I worked hard for my PhD, and I wanted to use it. But after a year, I went, okay, this isn't working really. Um, and so I took the job where I was at least on the sidelines of science uh, and not necessarily driving it. But I certainly did step back and uh, it could have been uh, that that's where I stayed and uh, that would have been it. And it would have been my job to be happy with that being it. And I would have been. Um, but then, in, as it turned out, I got a faculty job. I mean, I kept looking. I got a faculty job at the University of Waterloo. And unfortunately, my husband could not get an, an academic job with me. So it was his turn, and he took an industry job. Um, he keeps asking when it's his turn. So <laughs> uh, we'll have to see what, what happens with that. Um, but that's been my only struggle. I, I've always been treated with respect. Maybe I always just command respect. I don't know which it is. Um, but I've never, I've always had supervisors that treated me equally uh, to their other people uh, working with them. So I just simply haven't felt some of the uh, problems other women have felt. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So uh, I jumped ahead a bit uh, and skipped chronology. So let's go back to your university days. 
after graduating you went for your phd at university of rochester and your supervisor was gerard muru and it is here that you worked on his idea and made it into a reality and this reality that got both of you a nobel prize about 30 years later it sounds easy when i say it but uh, how difficult was it for you how long did the actual work take and uh, when you finally cracked it when you got it right and was it just like a eureka moment or did you know at that time that it was unique or uh, was it just a culmination a slow culmination of a lot of work excuse me ma'am um well so i will say that uh people talk about it being my first paper and it was my first paper but it was my fourth year uh of my phd so uh it was a long long struggle but i wasn't working on cpa uh that whole time but i was working on trying to get a high intensity laser to do a high intensity laser experiment um it was my supervisor that got the idea for crypt pulse amplification and it was my job for the next year uh to make it work and it did take a year and it's not all fun and games some of it was plumbing and some of it was machining and some of it was learning how to cut fibers and some of it was stringing fibers from one end of the lab to the other and um but some of it was just trying to figure out why things weren't working the way you thought they should be working and uh trying to figure it out so so that is uh the fun part um I certainly still remember the night that it worked. Uh this is why I brought Steve Williamson with me as one of my 14 uh guests is that uh I had no way uh, to measure if the amplified pulses were still short and amplified and compressed pulses and he said I you know my street camera can work for that and I and he you know he came in one evening after his own work was done and worked with me into the wee hours and uh we saw that it worked and so it it was very exciting and i certainly remember that it was very exciting one of the other um students in the group at the time came over to sweden with us and he said i still remember meeting you the next morning and you were still just jumping up and down letting me know it had worked and i remember how excited you were so i don't remember that conversation <laughs> i remember that night uh knowing that it worked and so this is what scientists look for right is that we have these exciting moments maybe only 1% of the time most of the time you're working working struggling thinking working struggling um and then the odd time is like wow it really works it really works uh i don't know that i thought it was nobel prize winning work i i did know that it would be a way to change high intensity laser physics and that people would be doing it and doing it in a new way uh, because of that work i am not on mute this time <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so it's uh, it's actually really interesting and i know you focused on the good part and the celebration and you're talking about the joy and i can feel the joy you may not remember it but i can feel the joy across this distance but i'm actually going to take you back to that one year like how how do you keep your focus and how do you continue to like you know every day you come into the lab and maybe some things work and some things don't so uh, how do you keep that focus on the end goal and not give up like did you go to your supervisor and say that this is not a good idea that this is not working should be changed or was it that you were convinced that you can do it Oh, I was convinced CPA would work. So that there was there was always some small struggles. I remember, you know, there was wiggles in our spectrum that shouldn't have been there and that was one of the things that we had to figure out. Uh and it was because we were the first time putting a broad spectrum to an amplifier and so we realized there was a piece that's usually in the laser that could no longer be there and then we had to figure out if we couldn't have that piece of the laser in there what could we do instead. Um but no, I knew it would work. I'll also say that uh people have to realize that although science to some extent you're doing by yourself it's you and and the laser and and building it um Gerard's group was a group and you know if I was frustrated a I could just go and moan to somebody else and just get the frustration out but, <laughs> but also if you had a real problem sort of the same as the idea with Steve Williamson when I said I don't know how I'm going to measure this and and he did know And so this is the point is that it, it is a team sport and you do 
whether it's just even trying to figure out what those wiggles were, you talk to somebody else and go, what do you think? And, you know, have you seen it and what's going on and uh, what could it be? And um, it's always a discussion and, and a wondering why and trying to figure it out. So there's that. And then there's just the team morale saying, come on, Donna, you can do it. Don't give up, you know. And I would maybe just go for a walk. I love to walk and just get rid of the frustration and then come back and do it. Cool. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions uh, from the audience for you on uh, this particular phase of your life, uh, the Nobel winning work. So the first question is from uh, Namrata Alwadi from Bal Bharti Public School, Pitampura in Delhi. Namrata? Um, good morning, Mr. Thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, uh, given to me to ask you this question. My question is, uh, how much was the contribution of creative thinking, what thought, in your prize-winning work? Well, certainly, I mean, it, it, there is always creativity. You have to always be uh, thinking about it. But again, one always has to remember that science doesn't come out of the blue. And um, so, so even though we came up with this new technique, all the pieces of it had been done by other people, right? Laser amplification was known for over 20 years. People uh, were working on something called fiber optic pulse compression just before this. And so that was part of the idea. And we could see, oh, that's, that's right. Now we just put the laser in between uh, or the amplifier in between. And so it's creativity, but as I said, we all stand on the shoulders of others and we all take pieces and have to see how the pieces fit together. And so you have to be open for new things, but you also have to realize that it's, there are so many unsung heroes in these stories. Some of us now get to shine as Nobel Prize winners, but um, there were the people working on fiber pulse compression that led to this work. And since, it, since our work, it itself probably wouldn't have come to the applications that we had. We had to have other people come and realize the fiber wasn't the best way and someone figured out how to do it with gratings. Somebody else said neodymium glass is not the best laser medium. And they came up with Thai Sapphire and that really opened up the field. And so science is always really just doing at the next sort of turning the cog of the wheel. Uh, it's just every so often one of them looks like it's a higher, brighter thing than the others, but it, it's still just one piece of the whole puzzle. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Anish from Siddharth Central School in Palimon, Kerala. Anish? Maybe she, she's on mute. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Anish, you are not audible. Yeah, you're not audible. We can't hear you. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Hello. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, yes, Anish, we can hear you. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Maria, ma'am. Uh, it was just the problem of my earphone. Sorry for that. Uh, I just want to convey the regards from my school, Siddhartha Center School. The whole team of Siddhartha want uh, to convey the regards to you, ma'am. Uh, you can hear hear me, ma'am? Yes. Okay, ma'am. Uh, just I'll go to my question. Uh, actually, I'm a physics teacher also, I'm the vice principal of the school also. So, uh, after this session, just I want to convey to my grade 10 students, just I want to convey the concept of uh, uh, chip pulse amplification to them. So, how I will explain this particular concept to them in your own words, ma'am. And one more thing, what is the first application used with this particular concept? That also I want to know from you, ma'am. All right. Uh, I like to say that I built a laser hammer. So sometimes it's energy, but sometimes it's energy per unit time. 
An analogy to that is trying to push with all your might a nail into a piece of wood and it doesn't go. But if you pick up a hammer and slam it in, it gets driven in. And so we built a laser hammer. That is, we took all the energy of the uh, laser uh, and squeezed it down into a very short pulse. And that's what made the laser hammer. Now, what was special about CPA is that if you try to do directly take a short pulse and put it through the amplifier, you had your laser hammer inside the amplifier. And what people found was they drilled holes right through the amplifier because they had um, this laser hammer. The same thing that now we use to carve out the cornea of the eye was happening in the laser rod. So w before we understood the nonlinear optics of it. And so what chirp to pulse amplification was about was saying, okay, we have a short pulse, let's stretch it and make it long. And you do this by chirping, which just means the colors change through the time. So we go from red to blue. And then we have a long pulse. And so now we can amplify it safely and not have a hammer, amplify it up so that it gets a lot more energy, but still long. And then we take it through a compressor and make it back short and strong. I will tell you now with the biggest lasers, this part has to be done in vacuum because even air starts to have to be a nonlinear medium and we start ionizing the air. And so the first application was the carving of the cornea. It was 10 years later. I had nothing to do with this work, so please give me no credit for it. Um, but it still came out of Gerard's group. Uh, Gerard worked with an ophthalmologist on, on this idea uh, and unfortunately came from an accident in that one of Gerard's students did get eye damage because of the laser. It was eye damage on the retina, but it was a perfect circle. Usually the lasers with long pulses will cause thermal damage. That means the light comes in, gets absorbed by your retina, is so powerful that it heats up and basically burns, you know, and that causes quite a problem. This is not, this is, um, cause, will cause damage, as I've said, but only in a very small, where the, where the light was focused right on the retina and it was a perfect round dot. And so it was the ophthalmologist that looked at that round dot, having never seen uh, damage to the retina that looked like that and went, what kind of laser were you using that would make that kind of round dot? And so he said to Gerard that he wanted to work with Gerard on the idea of can we use these very short, intense pulses to maybe do surgery of the eye and carve out these very fine dots, but now put them where you want them, not on the retina. You want them on the cornea <laughs> to carve out the cornea, you don't want them on the retina. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you to the CDC authorities for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, is that how the LASIK application, the laser eye surgery application, actually came about? That uh, one of somebody in the team had a I like you know retinal injury, and that started off a whole uh, different uh, stream altogether. Well, laser surgery happened for the CPA. Much later. Laser yeah. surgery, but it still does. The actual one that carves the shape into your cornea is still an eczema laser. That is not a short pulse laser. That is the idea that it's um, an ultraviolet photon, which is a high energy photon, and that does it. What, what the short pulse laser came and did is that the original LASIK surgery carved the outside of your cornea. Now, as we all know, if you poke yourself in the eye, get a piece of dust in your eye, it hurts. So your mm -hmm. nerves on your eye are on that outside layer of your eye to protect you, to let you know something's gotten in your eye. So it was very painful surgery. So this is why they realized what would be better is to just cut a flap, open up the flap, and then do all of that inside the cornea, which where there were no nerves, and then put the flap back. And so what this surgeon came up with with uh, Gerard was the idea that you could go through and raster scan your focus point and, uh, and it would be inside the cornea because it's clear, right? And so it only causes damage at the focus. So the focus is now mm -hmm. inside the cornea. You raster scan it and you can make a much more accurate cut than you can with a scalpel. But I understand it though, some surgeons still feel they're very capable and still use a scalpel for it. Um, and some people use the ultra fast laser uh, to cut the flap. Okay. 
I'm learning too. <laughs> so, <laughs> next uh, we have Archana Gaba from uh, Saint Kabir Gurukul, Jalalabad, Punjab, with her question. Uh, good evening, uh, Mario Ma'am. Mm -hmm. And very good, good, good morning to Professor Strickland. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Strickland, when I decided, you know, started my career as a teacher, my mentor used to say to me that if you can teach any concept uh, in such a simplified way that even a five-year-old can uh, understand it, that means that you have become a good teacher. So actually, I was going to ask the same thing which Anish said, and you have passed that test. So first of all, <laughs> I want to congratulate you again for that. And you could do that because you're not only a scientist, you're, you are a professor as well. So in continuation of that question, ma'am, I would ask, first, chirped pulse. Chirped is a very intriguing word in this context. As an English major, I mean, I couldn't, uh, I cannot place it like how, uh, why this is chirped. And secondly, as you have told, its implications for future, for this eye uh, health, vision, surgery, and all. Now that two years have passed since you made this discovery. So have you come, you know, some way forward? Have you been doing some more work on this, where you see that the same discovery can be used maybe in other fields also, in health sciences, or, or in any other part of science or engineering, ma'am? OK. So uh, first, I'll let me explain chirped uh, for you. Yep. Um, yes. A short pulse. First, you have to understand that a single color goes on forever. And it's only by adding all the colors. And the colors are waves of different lengths. And as you add these colors, they start to interfere. And so you can make a short, short pulse if you add more and more colors. So if you start with the short pulse that is made up of many colors, you can also imagine thinking a prism, all the colors bend different angles. This is because they travel different speeds in the glass. So this is why we used a fiber. We went down 1.4 kilometers of fiber. And so the reddest colors will travel fastest in glass and the bluest colors travel slowest. And so this is why the red came out ahead of the bluest. These are all infrared colors, but the longest wavelengths to the shortest wavelengths. But the for the colors we see, red has the longest and violet has the shortest. And so we could have just called it stretched pulse amplification, but chirp means like a bird's chirp. And a bird's chirp, when they sing their songs, is that in their one uh, note, they actually are changing uh, their frequency. They are really going through sort of the scale. And so I, I can't mimic a bird's chirp, but you can imagine. <laughs> um, and so that's why we use the word. Uh, so it is because the frequency uh, is changing or the color is changing as it goes in time. So now for application, I don't work on the biggest ones. Gerard is still a driving force to get more and more and more powerful pulses. I stay with the small scale systems in my own lab at the University of Waterloo. Once I, I actually like lasers that I, you know, I enjoy playing with like Lego blocks as a kid. So I like lasers sort of that size and not bigger. Okay. Uh, the most powerful lasers do require big, big lasers. They sit on sort of football sized fields of um, flooring. Uh -huh. So it takes huge teams to do all of these things together. Uh, but I was just uh, at a celebration uh, out of uh, Romania last week uh, talking about um, they have the world's most powerful laser now, 10 petawatts, uh, and all the different things that will come from that. So again, most of that will be pure science, but Gerard's favorite is trying to clean up nuclear waste with it. May or may not work. You can think about cleaning up uh, just all the space junk out of the atmosphere. So there's different, uh, other people just use it to make x-rays, and I have colleagues who are using it <clears throat> to study the roots of vegetation for crops, right? And so we, you don't have to kill the crop. You can now look at whether or not the nutrients of the fertilizer actually reach the roots. This is something still not really known when people spread fertilizer. Is it getting to the roots? Otherwise, you're wasting, you know, just 
ruining maybe something else by throwing that fertilizer on. So there are applications out there. I'm allowed to pretty much the same thing through science in my lab. Wow, thank you. That, that sounds really, very, very promising for the future. Thank you very much. I have a follow-up question from Prakriti, actually. Uh, like, just based on your answer, it made me recall her question. In your opinion, is there any field in science that has uh, great potential with application of lasers but hasn't been explored enough? You talked about a very diverse range of applications of lasers, from plants to space junk to, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> nuclear waste. <laughs> yeah. Lasers are everywhere. Um, and, and we in optics like to say that we're electronics, like the technology of the 20th century. Light and photonics will be the technology of the 21st century, right? We are speaking today in great part thanks to optics of so many kinds, whether it's because it goes through the fiber optics, whether the imaging of what we're all looking at on our screen, the, the cameras that we now use are incredible optical design uh, thing. And so it's hard to say where things will go. Um, I, I can't, you know, there's no application. I'm going, why aren't we using optics for it, right? Uh, part of my public policy work right now is talking about using photonics to make environmental so that we have better data to really drive policy between making a greener economy, right? And so, because one always needs data, one shouldn't be making public policy without data. And this is, you know, part of what science is, is about collecting the data. So, um, but uh, you know, the, the applications are everywhere. Just a matter of doing. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I see that 35 years later, your love affair with lasers continues to this day. That's uh, right. <laughs> so your current work is very experimental and cutting edge. For a layperson like me, it is the applications of your research that uh, engages, like, you know, a person like me. But as a scientist, I assume for you, it is the quest for new knowledge that drives you. Can you tell our listeners a bit more about your current research? Well, since I'm speaking to media, let me tell you that I'm working on Brahmin generation uh, in my lab uh, right now. Um, only not the way Brahmin himself would have seen it because he would not have had a laser at all. <laughs> and so we now have uh, what we call multi-frequency Brahmin generation where we are making colors from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And it's beautiful to see in the lab. Uh, it's every single color. When I'm giving my science talks about this, I try to show photographs of it. But photographs, we are not nearly as good as the uh, retina in your eye. We can actually distinguish every single color. But it is sort of like a picket fence. If we display it out of a prism to take these pictures, which we do, we'll see dot, 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 and every dot is a different color. And our eye can see that each color is there. So the reason for doing the work is what I said before, if you want really short pulses, you need many, many colors. And so this is a way of making many, many colors with the hopes of making a short pulse. My colleague next in the lab next door would really like very short pulses, so we can do stop action of molecular movies and watch how the energy moves through a molecule. But along the way, in this picket fence of frequencies, which should be equally spaced, separated by the Raman frequency, then we had these other little, little spikes showing up. And it was actually, almost, it must be 10 years ago, or more, I don't know, that my one grad student then said, what are they? And I go, I don't know, what are they? And we've been thinking about it ever since. What are they? Um, and so this is just what drives us. Nobody else is looking, I have to say. So it's not highly cited research, um, but I'm quite curious as to what they are. And so different students along the way have studied the spectrum for different energies or different this, different that. We now are measuring the time dependence of it. You know, and we're just, and we think we have our ideas as to what it is. So I now have a collaborator trying to do the theory and we have the people trying to better the measurements and uh, we'll see what those things are, whether it's useful to know in the end, time will tell. <laughs>
But for me, it's just the fun of see, understanding what's happening. Did I hear you say 10 years? Oh, easily. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sure it's been at least 10 years, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that puts a very different time scale to scientific discovery. <laughs> Science, people don't understand this, you know. I mean, the laser was invented in 1960, but it, it took a long time before we were really using them. And what we, we call in the business nuclear magnetic resonance couldn't be called that once it went to the hospitals. It had to be called magnetic resonance imaging because nuclear had a bad connotation. But you are still, you know, imaging the nuclei um, or using the nuclei for the imaging, I mean. Uh, and so... That, again, was sort of like a 20 to 50 year period between when scientists were trying to understand these nuclear magnetic resonances and then realizing that they could see images of them to, you know, finally doing it for MRI in the hospital. It, it takes a long, long time to see something, understand it, see it's where it goes and what applications. And, and so people have to appreciate that there's a long time scale for science. I think that is that's a very important takeaway from uh, this session. I'm going to bring in a few more questions on your uh, like on the process of research and your research now. Uh, the next question is from Anirban Chatterjee of Athenia High School in Saharanpur. Anirban. Yeah. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, and good evening, Maria, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, my question is, ma'am, um, at this present stage, when every research is geared toward, uh, towards commercial use, how do you motivate yourself to go ahead with uh, new and innovative research? You mean, why don't I want to do commercial research? Um, well, I don't know. I just, I only just do, I, I'm always motivated by what I just want to do. Um, and, and luckily, as an academic scientist, you can do it. I mean, I probably could have had better research grants and maybe more students if I was doing something that was more mainstream. Um, I think there's there's points for both. And so, and again, I think my Nobel Prize sort of tells the story is that um, I was trying to do a high intense nonlinear optics pure science thing. And I needed a better tool to do it. So we came up with chirped pulse amplification, which is a tool. Um, and then once we had that tool, we understood that we didn't really understand how high intensity light interacted with uh, materials. And so a lot of people had to start studying very fundamental processes of how it is the light interacted with the material with these really high intensities. And it was that understanding that led to us being able to be able to, to cut glass or cornea or anything that's transparent, right? Before this laser, you had to use heat. You had to absorb the laser light. Now you do not. You just come in and hammer those electrodes off of there, right? It's, so this is why we can now machine clear objects. And so, you know, so then it got to an application, but then that leads to new things and, and more understanding and new tools. And it just keeps cycling around. And, um, of course, one wants to get out there and, and get it to the commercial venues too, so that um, more people have access to it, right? You shouldn't just stay in the scientific lab. Once, once we understand how it works with the applications, there has to be somebody interested and driven to take it out of there and brought it into commercial. So it, one person is probably not gonna be the fundamental theorist to the experimentalist, to the tool maker, to the you know, commercial driver, to it's just, again, it's a chain and it requires a lot of people and a lot of people's work. Uh, and I really do think we all should be doing what, what drives us because then that makes us work the best we can. And so I think that just helps drive it. It's just a matter of making sure that you are in touch with people <laughs> on the lines, you know, the next chink in the armor or whatever on both sides to help keep moving it forward. Thank you, Mom. The next question is from Archana Singh of Amity International School, Saket in Delhi. Archana? Archana, ma'am, you are on mute. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. 
A very good morning, Professor Strickland. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is uh, around one of your quotes. Once you said that do what you love and what you think you are good at. Is this really possible with the today's time uh, with fixed curriculum, course content, and so much of competition to get into uh, get, for getting good grades and CGPAs to get into good colleges? Is it possible? for the students to pursue what they are good at and what they love doing? Well, I, in your education system is a little bit different than ours. Um, I think the Indian uh, one is probably more like the British one than the Canadian one is. Uh, we're, we're always in Canada halfway between the US and Britain. Uh, whereas the US is a very liberal arts education and you're supposed to be as broadly educated as you possibly can be. And the British system is much more, you know, by high school, you know, early on in high school, you should already be streamed and, and going and learning this. Um, so I will tell you that when I have students from India come and do summer internships with me, they're surprised I'm teaching nonlinear optics in grad school because they go, well, I already took that in third year. I went, yeah, because that's because you're in India and, you know, we're halfway to the American system here. Um, so we have probably more breadth uh, here than, than you do, but um, but we still get to pick and choose, right? And so I chose as few geography and history courses as I possibly could in high school. And I chose all of the math and physics courses that I could choose and the, and the computer science, which was very new in, when I was in high school. Um, and so it depends on how much choice you get uh, and how early you're streamed. Uh, that said, I do always like to point out to students that although I say I was no good at English, <laughs> and I wasn't, um, I wasn't the bottom of the class, but I certainly wasn't the top. Uh, I still think that out of everything you study, you must know how to communicate. It doesn't matter what field you're in, you must be able to speak and write. And so there's probably no more important subject than like, you know, language and communications. I won't say English, it depends on what your language is, but um, so, so that's very important. Uh, so there has to be some breadth, but I still think that I enjoy going into math class. To me, it was just like fun and doing puzzles. Uh, some other classes I, I struggled with uh, going into more so because just uh, it, it just wasn't fun. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't I can't answer it from an educational point of view, but I think that hopefully if you're streamed, you're streamed and you agree with the streaming. Uh, and that you really do have a love of it as opposed to somebody else telling you you have a love for it. <laughs> um, and I, do, I, you know, and I always marvel at the people who are good at everything. I honestly, you know, I've, I've met people who, you know, got their PhD. Uh, yes. you, 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 know, you, you did I, mention that. You did mention once that I don't know how they choose what to do. The people who are good at a lot of things. Exactly. How do you choose? I don't know. I mean, I think that would be much harder, but I never had to. I was so narrowly good at something that I never had to choose for myself. So I wonder at the people that, you know, have too many things at their disposal. Yes. I can't, I can't help them because I, have, I don't have any concept of it. Thank you. Thanks, Arjuna. Thank I you. Have, yeah. It's thanks, Arjuna. I'm going to ask you, uh, since we are talking about uh, liberal arts and uh, like, you know, arts versus science, I have a follow up to that. Donna, did you take art selectives in college? Oh, in engineering, we had to. Um, so, first, uh, I think I can do economics because it's the least arts of them all. Second year, it was a mandated that we take English. Now I will tell you, it was my uh, worst mark, but I still got a 75 in it. And um, when you know the report cards went home, I was stayed at McMaster to do a summer research project. And so I had a call home to get my grades. And my mother said, I can't believe it, Donna. You got a 75 in English. I went, mom, it's English for engineers. I'm not competing with honest to goodness English people here, mom. Like, you know, stay calm. Um, yeah, I actually got 100 that year. It's the only time I ever got 100, and she didn't care. She was more amazed that I could get a 75 in English. So then the next year, I took anthropology, which I got, you know, sort of interesting, but 
I got something like 70, I think it was like 74 or 76, somewhere in there in that. And mom phones me that year. She goes, Donna, anybody can, you couldn't have tried it all. Anybody can get a B in anthropology. I said, mom, you're sounding like an English snob now. You were very thrilled with that grade in English. So just be thrilled with it now. Um, yeah. And then finally I took a course on philosophy that was called logic. And I thought, well, I'm a very logical person. I could not understand the logic of logic. It was just the word. Like, I understood the certain symbols that you used in computer and math and stuff, the digital logic. I got that, but that was the first two weeks. And then there was this written, I don't even know what it was. I just had to sort of route it around going, is this logical? I don't see it as logical. Um, so that course sort of stymied me. Um, yeah, you know, to be honest, if I had not been mandated, would I have done it? Probably not. I'm very lazy. I only do what I want to do. Well, uh, 10 years for one problem. I don't know if I would call that lazy. <laughs> but again, another follow up to this. Uh, like, you know, so arts education, especially uh, in India today, its popularity has gone down. It's waned significantly. As a scientist, you have taken like, you know, liberal arts, whether you enjoyed it or not, you've you've had the benefit of a broader education, like you said. Uh, do you, what role do you see liberal arts can play in today's world? Do you think there is a role as a scientist? Well, absolutely. And, and as I said, you know, I am uh, working on public policy push for um, photonics for the environment. And if you're gonna have a policy uh, at all, you do have to speak to people in government and the chances of them being scientists, not high, even the ones working with science portfolios. Um, and so obviously scientists need to be able to communicate with the liberal arts people. The liberal arts people should also be exposed to science. I think we all need to see what the other one is. So as I said, we, as scientists, we must be communicators. I think the people on the liberal arts have to then also be educated slightly to understand the importance of these other technical areas um, so that we can all not speak each other's language, but at least meet somewhere in the middle and, and have meaningful conversations. We do need to have meaningful conversations. We do need to get critical thinking back into um, dialogues. We do need to quit thinking about I'm right, you're wrong, and, and have these kinds of conversations where we can as a society um, move forward along an optimum path, right? Uh, then we must yeah. keep taking data to make sure that what we thought was right there wasn't, you know, unforeseen wrong things with it, right? But um, yeah, so, so that's, there's reasons for both uh, because I think the public policy people, you know, have to also understand laws and everything else. So, so they need uh, to understand that side of uh, the world. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Tilotama Ravi from Hindu Senior Secondary School in Chennai for the next question. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. I'm just over to be the part of the session. Uh, my question is really basic, ma'am. Uh, we feel and we always say every kid starts out as a natural born scientist, then suddenly something changes and uh, they don't pursue or uh, they don't sustain their interest in science. Can you suggest a few thoughts uh, just through our education system to hold on with the kids' wonder and enthusiasm in science, ma'am? Yeah, there's a few things, right? Um, I think partly, you know, when you think about uh, watching a small child and they just even take their first step, I think they're taking their first step to A, see where they can go and B, how does it work? But everyone in the room is cheering that child on just for taking a step, right? Which is a pretty simple thing to do, but we're always so excited to see these first steps. And so they get cheered and they get, you know, and it's almost like they're star athletes, right? Now, when it goes and you get older, you still get those cheers if you're the athlete out on a field playing a sport, but who's cheering you on uh, doing uh, your math and, and science homework, right? So there's partly that. 
The other big, big, big problem is, of course, that also when I would go into um, an elementary school to teach, grade four is where we first teach optics. And so I would go in, certainly when my daughter was in grade four. And just every child in the class wants to answer every question. No, none of them care yes. that they may be wrong. It doesn't even enter their mind that their answer might be wrong. They're, they're, they're participating. They want to take part in the, my demos. They want to answer the questions. But when we reach the age of uh, puberty, I guess, we're all very self-conscious. And the last thing we want to be is wrong. And so we would rather not answer the question. So now we don't have people cheering us on. We don't want to look like we're wrong. And so we have to somehow in that age group get around this. And I think one of the big things now in, in understanding the way we teach science is that we have to get back to, although we have so much that has to be taught to them, right? And we can't keep reinventing the wheel. So we have to get through that. We have to get back to the asking the questions and having the students asking the questions and the wondering why. And so that when everybody is in the classroom wondering why, and you realize that most people don't know, then it's okay to not know, right? This is what scientists do for a living, is that we you know, join our group meetings or whatever and go, it's not working, why? Or we have these extra peaks in our spectrum, why? We don't know. And then the question is, what can we do to figure out why it's that way, right? And so scientists are always trying to wonder why, and this is not what we instill in our science students because they have to know so much science along the way. And we have to sort of, you know, and we're almost like cramming this knowledge into them. So it doesn't seem like fun. So we're not cheering them on. We're cramming them. They're insecure about being wrong. And this is what we have to change. So we have to have discussions in class about why things are, and then just be so thrilled when, and when as a class we figure it out, right? No singling out, but somehow there has to be that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling that people care that you did it, right? Um, you know, and then again, I think more people would go into science. Again, physics is for those of us that are real loners and we don't care about being cheered on and we're willing to be 10, 10 years in a lab by ourselves with our inanimate objects. But, you know, that's not the normal uh, thing. And so I think we could do a lot if we just changed it around and, and looked at it as a team sport and what motivates a team sport and, um, and use that to teaching science. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a lot for the wonderful uh, reply. Thanks a lot, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. I, uh, yeah, I've never thought about it, but uh, so right that when you have a sports event, sometimes the whole class, the whole school, the whole community comes out to cheer. But uh, yeah, you don't get any prizes if you get your math or your physics right. It's more of a smaller victory. So a lot of food for thought over there, which actually leads in very uh, well into my next question. You have spoken on multiple occasions about the lack of focus on, on science and science education in North America. Thanks to COVID-19, scientists have captured the global public attention this year. We're seeing the scientific process playing out in real time, I think, for the first time. There have been plenty of discussions surrounding the scientific method, scientific facts, but surprisingly, there have been a lot of discussions have, which have been really polarizing, like you have the anti-vaccination lobby. And you mentioned this a bit earlier when you said that both sides have to have a conversation. Like, you know, there's a lot more conversation needed now. So what can we do today to spread more scientific literacy in our society? Yeah, I think that's a tougher question because I was talking to people, you know, after I won about how to do science literacy. And I said, it's not enough to convince scientists to be better communicators. You know, I give a lot of public talks, not now because of COVID, but <laughs> I gave a lot of public talks. But I was also very aware that everybody in the audience were science enthusiasts, right? People didn't come to hear my talk based, you know, if they were anti-science or what have you, right? It was already science lovers coming to hear my talk. So we need the sociologists and the psychologists to work with us 
to, it's another reason to do liberal arts, um, to find out what it is about people that, you know, does that. We also have to sort of uh, fight this idea of the elite, in, and maybe it's more of a North American thing, but where the college educated elite doesn't understand what the common person does, right? And so I think that's a shame, right? Whereas probably when I was growing up, the highly educated were the people that we would look to. We would ex expect that they did have answers that we didn't have. Now, maybe I felt like that because, as you said, my parents were university educated, and so maybe it was never there, but I think it was more so. I think people would agree to that. Um, and I don't know if it's the political system. I don't know if it's media. I don't know how this is sort of spun out of control. Um, but somehow we've allowed it to spin to the point where there's, there's just two sides. And of course, there's multiple, yes. there's no two sides. It's, it's very yeah. multifaceted. Every question is multifaceted. And, and so as a society, uh, and I think universities have to be out there really trying to talk about the fact that every question is multifaceted, get different uh, voices at the table, but also not have these debates that have turned into more, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, uh, but have the, the discussion as to what each side is seeing and, and feeling and experiencing so that we understand either the fears to see, can we allay the fears? Are, are, are the fears based in something that is because it's a misunderstanding? Or is it a true fear? And you know, you have to be honest about these are um, the results that a vaccine is only so, uh, you know, there, there is some small chance that something can go wrong. And you, you must say that compared to the alternatives, right? Um, and so, yes, it's a matter of uh, going back to the idea that we must promote from an early age through all of life, a uh, definite idea that we must have everybody at the table is way more than two sides. Let's get back to having uh, critical thinking conversations and hearing everything and actually hearing the other person. So uh, you've talked about your role in Canada in developing public policy, not just at this point, but a couple of times in a few questions earlier. What can, like CBSE is the largest board in India. So we have the biggest platform possible over here. What can a board or schools over here, we have district level, we have officials, uh, provincial level officials, and of course we have principals in this forum right now listening to you. What can schools and higher educational institutions do to promote more scientific literacy? I don't know, I'm, I think that, again, I think it would be nice to have it formed into a game thing. I remember being in middle school and we had these color days. And so you were taken out of your classes and, and each of you were given, you know, the 12 different colors. And all of a sudden you met people from all the classes. And it was, but again, it was more like sports games or something. But I would love to see people, A, brought out of the comfort zone and have just days. And the, it could be um, climate change days. It can be, feeding the poor days. It can be, um, pollution, you know, I'm just trying to think, you know, pharmacology days, COVID days, all these things, and have teams and bring in all the various areas and have the questions be about how does one come up with the right public policy? What, what data should be taken? What, you know, what is, you know, and again, have them, and it be again, like a game, just like sports are games and make people have a lot of fun trying to figure out these things and hearing different sides of it. I think it would go a long way to getting back the idea that uh, we are just one cog in this great big wheel. And, um, but, but that everything should be made to be enjoyable uh, and that can be fun. You have to go back and just do the hard work. <laughs> but if you have fun for lunch, it would be nice if, if we could gather as groups and, and in a fun way. So, is in uh, climate. She was, uh, works in climate change, and I could, I can actually see her jumping up with joy, saying, "Yes, a climate change day and games around it is a wonderful idea." 
<laughs> so I think I've hogged you for some time. So at this point, I'll take a few questions from the audience again. Uh, next question is from Suj Sujata Girish, Daffodils Foundation for Learning from Bangalore. Sujata. Such a thing. <laughs> Greetings of the day to you, Professor. Thank you. Greetings. It's uh, wonderful to interact with you. It's definitely having a lot of learning value. Uh, now, we principals, especially in the virtual scenario where the classes are going online, we have become digital teachers and digital principals now. I have a challenging question before me, and I would like to seek your advice regarding this. The current generation of students are spoiled for choices when it comes to use of technology. I'm sure you understand that. Uh, how do we create an ecosystem which helps the students to strike a balance so that they benefit out of technology and they don't become victims of technology? Over you know, I was hearing that as a child myself. Um, and I still remember my grandmother who came from a small village. And she still in her day, which was my day as a child, just picked up a phone and someone would say hello and she would say who in the village she wanted to talk to and then she would come to our house and see this dial on our phone and go i don't even know what to do i don't know what you and then she would see us kids on a tv and going you cannot just spend time on a tv that will ruin it you know so these discussions have gone on i don't know um before radio whether they had these discussions but i think my whole life we've been hearing about how it's destroying us um it's changing us. There's no doubt about that it's changing us. And maybe this is part of the polarization process and the way, the reason we have given up on conversations, right? Uh, and so we do have to, obviously, I have a proponent for, for not allowing us to go down. And I also think that with the latest systems, we're all only listening to what we want to listen to. And that's really the issue is that if you just tune into your little thing or watch your little bit on TikTok now or whatever it is you're watching, um, you're only hearing one side, forget two sides, let alone multifaceted, you've, you've brought yourself right down to one side. Uh, and so I think again, as a society, we have to keep bringing in uh, as much as we can. I think we should be using technology. I see no reason not to use it. I just think that we have to make sure that every person is made aware that there's always many sides to the story and to challenge them to um, watch, a, you know, listen to a channel that they would normally never listen to and, I, and, and then have a conversation. I think if two people listen to each other's stations and then had a conversation about it, it would be fun for them. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm sure I have taken some advice from your end. We will take it back to our schools. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, next question from Omar Shankar Mohanta from uh, DAV Public School, Tensa in Odisha. Uh, good evening, ma'am, Maria. And very good morning, Professor Strickland. Uh, actually, I'm very nervous and I actually forgot what I just rehearsed. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was very good in physics and mathematics till grade 12. So I was very sure in my head that I'm going to pursue physics in my grad. So I took physics and the first year it was good. The second year, second year started getting difficult for me because uh, I don't want to trash my teachers or professors, but uh, they were quite unenthusiastic when it came to like clear my problems and doubts. So somehow I got through grad school and somehow I even got through post grad and I even got into PhD. But uh, just before enrolling myself into that PhD, PhD, I developed cold feet and I thought, okay, I don't know much about physics and I don't know anything about physics. There were there have been a lot of gaps in that because uh, I didn't understood most of the concept that I went through the grad school and post grad. So I had an insecurity that I'm not good enough. So I took a step back and I didn't get my PhD and I started doing a lot of other things. And then I came back again to school teaching physics. So 
leaving physics for a while and then coming back teaching physics now i feel very insecure and i sometimes i am exactly like my professors unenthusiastic sometimes i give a lot of um, lot unenthusiastic reply to my students when they ask something unrelated to content matter and everything so i don't know how to deal with this insecurity because i feel like i was good at physics and it's like an x uh, love of mine but uh, i'm not able to date any other subject but i can't go back to physics because i have this insecurity that there have been lot of gaps so how can i deal with this insecurity i'm sure i don't know for sure but i'm sure that you must have felt this way that whether i'm doing it right or not whether i am whether i should keep doing it or not so i don't know how to deal with it and how can i be a better teacher because i really don't want to see my professors in me i will say that i've never felt the imposter syndrome more since winning the nobel prize okay <laughs> i think so like you're all listening to me like i have answers and of course you wouldn't have listened to me 5 years ago because i was an ordinary person um and so you know and yet i i people want me to talk and so i do um so of course this is this is a fact of life that we mostly go through life wondering if we're good enough uh and i think we all need to understand that we all feel that i think again and i'm glad that you're saying it as a man because i've had so many girls ask me about being the imposter syndrome because i'm a woman and i said i'm sorry but trust me the boys are feeling it every bit as much as the girls but maybe they don't feel like they can say it um so this is the way most of us feel i will also say that you know um i watched my daughter who got her undergrad physics degree she's now uh doing her phd in astronomy but in second year a lot of her um friends were switching out of physics right it is second year physics is is the hard one no doubt about it uh and you know i guess maybe she benefited from having a physics professor mother i don't know but i said look it don't don't quit right now try to get a research project in the summer so that you know what physics is really like because it is not what you we do in classes because again we are trying to get all this knowledge into people and um it's not the scientific way of life and so uh so i sort of said if you, if after the summer you don't still love it then by all means you have plenty of time there's no reason not to switch fields and go into something else and just because your mother's a physics person doesn't mean you should be a physics person and, and you know you can explore it but i said don't give up on it. The other thing I said to her is like back to my team sport. I said physics is a team sport. It's not just you trying to figure it out. I said, you know, you've got to make friends in your class and you've got to talk to people about it and try to figure it out from that. Again, I think this is we put too much onus on the teachers teaching us, but it's well known that about 95% of it is you learning it and only about 5% is is how the teacher explains it, right? the teacher can't shove something in your brain and and scream it all around i mean it is up to us to struggle to learn it and it is a struggle to learn it um and on probably any subject but certainly physics and mostly physics because it is counterintuitive right if you go back to my idea of a crawling child um we learn as this is when we love to learn and yet what we learn is that to keep moving you must keep pushing but this is of course aristotle's way of thinking not newton's way of thinking and so we have to fight that all the time in physics is that our own gut instinct is wrong <laughs> and so that this is one of the brain synapses that as a physicist you must make that your own gut reaction is wrong and that that is not how physics works that you know in the absence of all forces you would keep moving at constant uh velocity and so this is physics is particularly hard to learn because we are always i think other subjects follow along with how you've learned from birth on and physics we have to so <laughs> no the way you've taught yourself is wrong <laughs> uh and and get around that but you know understand that what you're feeling is the imposter syndrome you know if you got through the system you got through the system and and the your teachers were saying that you did do do it well enough and if you got into grad school you were obviously doing it really well enough and so we all feel it we all don't understand it but again you want to talk to as many people as you can and you'll find they don't understand it any better 
and, uh, and, and just be happy with it. And so when you're talking to your students, I think you should be honest with them and say, this is what I struggle with, you know? And then the part I'm having trouble understanding is this. Does anybody have a way to see it, right? There will, there will be very bright students in your class that will scare you how smart, you know, how smart they are. Um, but you have to let them shine too and uh, marvel at how smart they are. Um, but even know that they're probably thinking they aren't all that smart. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the more that you can be honest with people and, and, and talk about the learning process, I think the better we all are. Just my own thinking about it. Good luck. Thank you so, thank you so much, fun. Professor Strickland. That was really <laughs> nice to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sonia Mago from Swami Santhas Public School from Jalandhar in Punjab. Greetings, ma'am. This side, Dr. Sonia Mago from Swami Sundas Public School, Jalandhar. Uh, greetings to you on behalf of entire Swami family and thanks to CBSC for providing us this wonderful platform. Uh, it's like a dream come true that I am interacting with a Nobel Prize winner. Ma'am, according to Thomas Kuhn, the growth of science depends not only on linear progression of knowledge creation, but also depends on paradigm shift of uh, scientific revolutions and aptitude. So my question is, where do we expect the next breakthroughs in physics? I mean to say, in which scientific fields will the Nobel Prizes be given in future and why? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't think anybody can answer that. Um, you know, it, the only times you can ever say what, if, who's going to win the Nobel Prize is when something really big has happened that year. Yeah, when LIGO measured gravitational waves, we all knew, oh, that's the Nobel Prize winner of that year. Yeah. Uh, when Higgs boson was seen uh, by CERN, we went, mm, we know what the Nobel Prize is this year. Uh, but, but other than those few years, you know, we have um, a survey done in our department. Uh, it was funny the year I won, there was a technical glitch and it didn't go out, right? So I sort of kidded the, the colleague who usually puts it out, who do you think will win the Nobel Prize? I went, did anybody guess me? I'm thinking <laughs> not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the beauty of science. I don't think anybody knows a priori what's going to catch on. I think, you know, you're doing engineering. If you are really working on an application that you understand and that you are working towards, to me, that's engineering. Okay, that's that's not science. I think science is it's you know you're still there doing something that you can't really see where it's going. Um, so so no, I I don't like to predict. I have no idea. I also think it's one of the traps we fall into as a scientist. Um, and maybe I was lucky that I did CPA so early and knew that it was not the Nobel Prize. I went for thirty years because I think he was going to get the Nobel Prize. But I also felt like yeah, I've accomplished that. Um, I'm not as driven to make sure I make my mark now, and I can just have fun in the lab. Um, but but I think the way we all fund science and the way you know it's based on these citations and this and that, and so we have to be looking at popular areas of the time, right? Um, and so whereas the Nobel, it's is not a lifetime achievement prize. The Nobel is for doing one thing. And so it is for someone who sort of, you know, took a right or left turn away from everybody else and, and found something new. Um, and, and, but you can't predict a priori when someone's all of a sudden going to jig jag somewhere <laughs> else uh, out of the way. And, and then of course, the other side of the Nobel is that it's um, about, uh, helping humanity or what you know the greatest benefit to mankind or whatever it was uh and again if you're doing science and you don't know what the application is going to be down the road it's very hard to say which one ends up being that right which one was a benefit to society you don't know so i can't answer your question i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so uh moving on rajni sharma from shamrock senior secondary school mohali she has a question yeah. I'm curious to know the answer for that one also. Uh, thank you, Ms. Maria. And good morning, uh, Professor. Uh, my question is, what has the Nobel allowed you to uh, do uh, that you would not be able to do otherwise? So much. It is a life-changing experience. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, I 
even if somebody had told me like five years ahead of me winning, oh, in five years you're going to win the Nobel Prize, I don't think I would have realized what a night and day shift it really is. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I've actually gotten in to have an audience with the Pope. I'm not Roman Catholic, but that's still amazing to me. Um, you know, I've gotten to meet uh, astronauts that landed on the moon. Um, I got to meet rock stars. I got to meet Brian May of Queen. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll also say that, you know, on the public policy, which I was working on before the Nobel, uh, I will tell you that um, government leaders want to see me now. <laughs> and they didn't want to without this, um, right? So somebody anointing you with the Nobel Prize says, oh, you are really special. Uh, and this is what I get back to the imposter syndrome, you know, but supposedly what made me special was the work I did as a PhD student. And so if that's really what made me special, I was special for those 30 years and people just didn't know I was special. Right? <laughs> and all of a sudden somebody gives you a prize and all of a sudden you're special. And so people like you ask me questions and think I have answers, but I have no more answers now than I did then. Um, and so it's a, it's a very strange experience to, uh, to go through this. Um, and I, I mean, I take the opportunities to, to meet these great people. So then I find myself speaking. I mean, I was on a panel about going to Mars with these astronauts. I'm going, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> lectures about going to Mars, but put me on the panel so I can meet them. All right. And I'll just, you know, and the moderator was very good about, you know, trying to find things he could ask me on this panel, you know, um, <laughs> but uh you know so you have to just go with it if you if you want to have these experiences and uh but no it's 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 day and night it's it it really is day and night how uh, getting a prize like this is well, thank you mom thank you so much for the answer thank you so just thank you ma'am share curiosity hey. from my side would you go to mars if you had the option to Oh, I would never even be an astronaut. And, and meeting them, I've talked to them about it, right? I am so claustrophobic. I'm so afraid of heights. Um, the idea of, you know, and they actually had, had this thing that, you know, Brian May does, which is about bringing science to the masses, right? He has concerts and it's just incredible. Um, you know, one of the uh, astronauts that had been up on the space station had a video and it was trying to show how spacious it was. And I would be going, I would be going, I have to get out, I have to get out. But then the other talk was about getting into these spacesuits. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, to get out, you'd have to get into that spacesuit. And I would feel like I was like, you know, dying. No, I am I am a scaredy cat. I'm not going to Mars. Not unless it's like the best alternative because Earth is, you know, on fire or something. But um, I'm too scared to do anything like that. Me too. <laughs> so, um, last audience question is from uh, Bhaveen Gupta from Modern School, Barakamba Road in Delhi. Bhaveen? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, I'm a school counselor. So I'd like to ask you, what would you advise what advice would you give to students aspiring to study pure physics? Oh, well, just if you love it, do it. I think, you, I mean, again, I, I will go back to what always. Um, when I was in grad school uh, in the United States, it was during the Reagan Star Wars days. And so Reagan was, you know, there was still the Iron Curtain and what have you, and there was the missile crisis. And, and he was hoping that lasers could blow down uh, Russian missiles if they happened to come into space, right? So there was a lot of money being spent on laser research right then. I mean, it was just a great field to be in. And all of a sudden, Sherrod's group got very big. And But a lot of the students didn't seem like they were doing it out of sheer love. Like, it was just, to them, sort of a job they had to do. And, and I said, why are you joining Sherrod's group? I don't get it. You don't really seem to love this. And he goes, well, it'll be a good job at the end. And I went, you know, we're here for seven years doing our PhD. You don't know what job's going to be out there seven years from now. Um, and, and most of them then dropped out of Gerard's group because you did have to work long hours and you really had to work hard. And, and I think if you didn't really just love it, you know, I'm not saying there weren't frustrating times and times I went for my walks and everything, but overall, I think if you don't really love what you're doing, it's hard 
to really put in that kind of effort. And so uh, that has to be, they have to understand if they love it, I think they'll do a good job. And if they do a good job, they'll, they'll get to keep moving uh, forward, you know. But also, like I said, um, I took on a technician's job at Princeton, a member of technical staff, to help scientists and not be the scientist. And I would have been happy doing that if that's what uh, life had done too. So <laughs> it's, it's, I, I am a very big believer that you have to try to make your life fit you. Um, but I think it works best if you go after what you love. So if they really love physics, they should do it and go for it. Hello. And put all the heart and soul in it. I think that's a beautiful. Mon yeah. Thank, Mon you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful answer for a, like, you know, for a session which we are actually coming to an end. But uh, as we come to the end of this session, I wanted to ask you something which has become kind of a norm in a lot of Indi like in the Indian uh, chat shows or interview format, what we call a rapid fire question, which are short questions that one asks with uh, very short immediate answers. So it doesn't like you know, take too much. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions which will help us know a bit more about yourself and what you like. So I'm going to begin with what was your favorite book in school? I don't actually remember that. I, what I remember was driving my dad crazy as a very young child, um, making him, he, he had to read Molly Whoopi to me a thousand times. In fact, for the rest of his life, he called me Whoop. I mean, he started by calling me Molly Whoopi and it shortened to Whoop. But, um, and it is, just so you know, it's a British fairy tale. And it's about three sisters being kicked out of the family because they you know, couldn't afford to keep all the kids. And, and Molly Whoopi was the youngest of the three and the other two were beautiful. And then, of course, there was a, a king with three princes. And, and, but it was big, the youngest one was the one that was all about having spunk and brains. And she figured out how to do all of these challenges. And that, you know, one by one, they each got their prince. But the other two older sisters were beautiful and useless. So now I do have an older sister who I think was the prettier one. I don't think as a young child I was thinking that way. But I read it to my daughter, and she didn't get it at all because she just has an older brother. So. Um, but to me, I think it really spoke to me as a young child that you should have spunk and brains and get out there and do things. Okay, so that's my, but older than that, I can't <laughs> one. Okay, so yes. That no, I question? think, yeah, that's, that definitely answers my question. And a uh, favorite book now, or maybe the last book that you read, if you don't have any clear favorite. Well, I've been asked that a lot, so I realize now it is Pride and Prejudice. Um, I love Pride and Prejudice. Uh, I think it, it is my idea of feminism. I think, you know, uh, the main character uh, refused to just marry based on um, trying to, yeah. you know, at a time when uh, a woman either had to get married or she was going to become a governess if she was in that sort of strata, right? I mean, poorer women just out of work no matter what. That's just the way life yeah. is, right? Um, and, but it's a pretty scary thing to think you would be raised with money and the next thing you know, if you didn't marry well, you really were sort of cast aside. And, you know, it's a story about how she refused to do it. And, um, but still, you know, it's, and ultimately, I think it's because a woman brought a proud man to his knees. And so what woman doesn't want to cheer that? Sorry, ma'am, to disturb you, but I am having one question. Can I ask? Yeah. Which... Uh... I'm sorry, like, which Mama, book I'm... on physics? Uh, Ma'am, I am having one question. I want to ask. Okay, who is this? Ma'am, I am Saksha. Ma'am, I am a student. Uh, Ma'am, I am studying in 8th class in BCM school. Ma'am, my question is that, Ma'am, is really, is really study in foreign is very good? Maybe, Saksha, we can take this question a bit... Uh, uh, later because that's something that uh, I can always answer a bit later so we we can uh, uh, Donna if I have to uh, he just wants to know do you think international education is good uh, um, I think there's um, far more opportunities in my, in my day I don't know that people even thought about it much now we're all moving around the globe so well um, so, I, you know, I think if you have the opportunity to, to study some other place, it's probably a really good thing to do. Yeah. 
Okay. So going back to my rapid fire, which book on physics do you think everyone should read? And as a non-physics person, I must ask: Is there any one such book? Is there a book on physics that everybody should read? I don't know if there's a. I don't know that I would say I have a book on physics. You know, I mean, I have a lot of optics textbooks and stuff, but I think the only one that would relate was um, I. I got because I was at Los Alamos. Uh, I decided to get Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. And it is really a funny book. I don't think you have to be a physicist to enjoy it, but it really is his story about getting all the way to sort of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos and, you know, his education and, and what have you. And, um, and, and he is just a very funny, it's just a very funny read. So I would recommend Shirley you're joking, Mr. Prime. Okay. Do you have a favorite movie or a TV series or a streaming series? You mentioned The Big Bang Theory earlier, though not a fan, of course. I'm happy that it brought physics to the forefront, right? Um, I'm trying to think if I have one right now, because it probably changes, you know, as it goes along, I'll have a new one as opposed to an old one. I mean, I actually just like things like uh, mysteries. And so I think it's the Australian one, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries or something. I've, I've sort of, it's something like Ms. that. Miss Fisher? So, and, and it's just, you know, it's from the 1920s and she's just a woman that's uh, out there saving the world in her own very stylish way. But, yeah. But that's just no. thing, education. Yeah. Right? Uh, okay, so from Miss Fisher, moving to the future, do you read or watch sci-fi? Sci-fi? Yeah, no, I, I, really, I really just like sci-fi. I, I know a lot of scientists love it. I just, it bothers me when the science is wrong. I actually walked out of a movie that was, you know, and it was actually an optical thing and there, there was gradings and they were, and I went, that, that wouldn't work at all. I don't even know. And I just had to walk out. I just said, no, it doesn't work like that at all. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Absolutely fine. So which class do you love teaching? Which topic or which class do you absolutely adore teaching and why? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I like to teach my own area. So I do teach um, a senior level lasers course, and I teach a grad level nonlinear optics course. And so I would say those are the courses that I enjoy teaching the most, probably because I can bring uh, the most background to it, right? The other course I ended up teaching a lot at Waterloo is electricity and magnetism. And I don't dislike teaching electricity and magnetism, but um, of course, we go, we go from the 16th century to the 18th century. <laughs> we, sort of, or the, we get to the 19th century, so, and we stop there, right? We stop with Maxwell's equations. Um, and, and I don't read a lot of history of, of physics, and so I can't really bring in as much to it. I really can only stick with the facts uh, or, you know, the physical processes and understanding how, the, how to do it. But I, I can't bring in stories which, when I'm talking about lasers, I can bring in more stories from my own time, studying it and going to conferences and hearing about it. Okay. Uh, next, second last question. What is the one character trait that a student of science should have, according to you? I think they need both curiosity and tenacity. Okay. You know, nothing just comes like that. So you have to really have patience. I mean, tenacity or patience, whichever one. Which actually, perfectly segues into my next question. What would you credit more for your success? Natural ability or hard work? Ah, uh, it, is a, it is a combination of both. I think, I, I mean, I was very lucky to be very good in math and physics. And so it came naturally to me. Uh, but I certainly, for my PhD, I was putting in the long, long, long hours. Thank you. Professor Donna Strickland, winner of the 2018 Nobel Prize for Physics, thank you for that amazing session, for your absolute patience in answering questions and explaining the fundamentals of your discovery to us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and for being an absolute inspiration today. Thanks so much. I will now hand over to Ms. Archana Thakur from uh, CDSC, Deputy Secretary CDSC, for closing remarks. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Stickland for such a wonderful and interact enriching interaction. 
it was really a great opportunity for all of us to interact with you ma'am and hear from you only about science physics and, and in your own life experiences and uh, my gratitude to maria ma'am also with whom the training unit has been coordinated since the very inception of the idea of this program and with all your efforts and cooperation ma'am this session has been successfully conducted my sincere thanks to honorable chairman sir and uh, director training under whose guidance the, this idea has been transformed into reality and at last my utmost thanks to all the participants who are here uh, and are the part of this session from all over the country and the cbsc officials who had been uh, present throughout this session thank you all thank you ma'am very much thank you thank you thank you so much donna and uh, have a good day yeah thank you professor Bye donna huh? it's a really great session huh? so we all enjoyed <laughs> thank you thank you thank you and sir have a great day ahead. yeah thank you maria Thanks, sir. Bye. Bye, Donna.